How fast a reaction happens is called the rate of reaction. Any rate is a change in a quantity divided by time. In chemistry's case, that could be the quantity of reactant used or product formed, or the effect that these have. So we could measure a change in mass or volume of gas that's made, or a color change, for example. The boards, however, like to stipulate that this technically gives us mean rate, as the rate could be changing over the time you measure. But that's true for any measurement made over time ever, so that's a bit redundant, but we'll go with it. An experiment on this could be reacting hydrochloric acid and sodium thiosulfate in a conical flask sitting over a piece of paper with a cross drawn on it. As the reaction progresses, the product formed, it's a precipitate, turns the solution cloudy. We say the turbidity has increased. We stop the timer when we can no longer see the cross from above the flask. Repeat this at different temperatures, and you should see that the hotter the temperature, the less time it takes, so therefore the faster the rate. Another potential experiment is measuring the volume of gas produced by a reaction by using a gas syringe that fills up when it's connected to the reaction vessel. A graph to show this would have the quantity on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. It's usually a curve that starts off steep but then levels out or plateaus, which shows that the reaction has completed, or we can say reached its end point. To find the rate at any time, you draw a tangent at that point and find the gradient. Pro tip, turn the page so you're drawing the tangent horizontally. That will help you draw it accurately. Then, like the equation says, you can take the change in quantity and divide by time. Up divided by across, that's the gradient. The rate of reaction can be increased by the following. Increasing the concentration of reactants if they're solutions. Increasing the pressure of gas reactants. And increasing the surface area of solid reactants, that is, crushing them into a powder. Now these three changes all have this effect because the reacting particles collide more frequently. They come across each other more often. Increasing temperature does that too due to the particles moving more quickly, but there's an added bonus that they also collide with more energy, meaning they're more likely to react when they collide, due to activation energy and all that. Finally, adding a catalyst also increases rate as it reduces the activation energy needed, so particles are more likely to collide successfully and react. Another slightly weird modern way of putting it is that a catalyst provides an alternative reaction pathway. Any catalyst is not used up in a reaction though. It's not a reactant or product itself. A reversible reaction does pretty much what it says on the tin. Once the products are made, they're able to react in the opposite way and make their original reactants again. The prime example is the harbour process. Hydrogen and nitrogen react to make ammonia, but then that can break down back into its separate gases again. In a closed system, that is, no particles or energy goes in or out, both reactions continually take place. Eventually, the quantity of particles on both sides will reach a point at which the rates of both the forward and reverse reactions will be the same, so that means there'll be no more overall change in the quantities on both sides. So we're technically not saying that the reaction has stopped per se, it's just that there's no more overall change, that is, until a condition is changed which will affect these rates. Le Chatelier's principle states, If a system at equilibrium is subjected to a change, the system will adjust to counteract that change. Sounds awfully vague, so let's see what that actually means in practice. There's a greater number of moles on the left than on the right of this reaction, which means that the reactants take up more space. Therefore, if you increase the pressure of all these gases, we say this favours the forward reaction. That is, the rate of the forward reaction will increase until equilibrium is once again reached. This will, of course, result in more ammonia made, or we might say we have a higher yield of ammonia. We could also say that the position of equilibrium is shifted to the right. Reducing the pressure would, of course, do the opposite by shifting the position of equilibrium to the left instead. Concentration follows the same principle when it comes to solutions, by the way. Naturally, if you remove molecules from one side of the reaction, the position of equilibrium shifts in that direction, so more of that product is made. So if it's reached equilibrium and we remove ammonia from the vessel, then more ammonia will be made. With reversible reactions, one direction will be exothermic and the other will be endothermic. That always has to be true. Increasing the temperature, in essence, means it's harder for a reaction to produce heat. That means a hotter temperature favours the endothermic reaction. In this case, that's the reverse reaction. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? An endothermic reaction requires net energy being put in, so a higher temperature provides that. A colder temperature will favour the exothermic reaction. In this case, that's the forward reaction. As a rule of thumb, any reaction that involves the breaking down of one reactant, ammonia in this case, with a reverse reaction, that's going to be endothermic. So I hope you found that helpful. Leave a like and a comment if you did. And click on the card to take you to the playlist for all of the papers. And don't forget to check out the Science Shorts app to help you test your knowledge.